Hello and welcome to Merck's webinar titled Contract Management in a Nutshell, Principles and Practices. The focus for today is the three main phases of the contract management process. Uh, my name is Ala Elbaz and I'm excited to share with you today some takeaways from, some, from my years of experience working for leading companies in North America and the Middle East. Over 30 minutes, I will go over a number of slides, after which I will open the floor for your questions. We will then take another 30 minutes or so to answer your questions. Please feel free to type any question into the chat box. You see it on the lower left corner uh, of the window on your screen, and I will, I will, uh, I will, we will capture them and we'll try to address them one by one at the end of the session. Okay then, let's get started, I guess. Uh, the contract management in a nutshell, principles and practice. Uh, we are going to talk about, um, uh, this is a little bit uh, brief, a bio for myself. Um, my name once again is Ala Elbaz. I have a bachelor degree in mechanical engineering from Kuwait University. I have also a master's degree in mechanical engineering from University of Jordan. I have an MBA from Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan, in the United States. I am also a PMP certified. Uh, professionally, I've been working as a project engineer uh, in Industrial Development Bank of Jordan. I worked there for a couple of years, and then I worked as a project slash contract manager in Daimler Chrysler, General Motors, and Ford Motor Company. Uh, that's, I spent almost together like around 15 years altogether there. I also worked as a part-time lecturer in University of Phoenix and Baker College. Seven years ago, I joined Merck, a part of the staff. Currently, I'm a partner with Merck. So that's a little brief about myself, and we're going to get started uh, with the agenda. Uh, we're going to start off today by defining contract. What do we mean by the word contract? We're going to then, after that, we're going to go to different contract types, and then we're going to talk about contract framework. Uh, after that, we're going to go with the contract preparation, contract award, and contract administration. Those are the three main phases of any contract. Uh, the first one is uh, preparation, then award, and the last one is administration. Other people address them by pre-award, award, and post-award. It's the same thing, but different, you know, um, different connotations sometimes. Uh, the last thing we're going to do is some contract management best practices. Uh, defining a contract. How do we define a contract? Uh, contracts are basically uh, usually are defined as a, as a binding agreement. What do you mean by that? They they are it's a binding agreement between two parties or more. Uh, to do something or to refrain from doing something. Uh, so basically, one party will pay probably another party in order to do something or sometimes to refrain from doing something. What do we mean by binding? Binding means enforceable by law. So if two parties are uh, between them, there's a contract between them, and the reference for them in, in case there was a conflict and they end up going to court, will be the contract. So the contracts will be the reference for them, and that's why the word binding. So that's what the judge will look at it, and that's why it is called binding. So it's forcible by court. Um, the other part will be agreement. The word agreement has three components. Uh, it has an offer, acceptance, and consideration. So when we say uh, an agreement, we, we talk about we talk about three party, three parts. It will be an offer acceptance and consideration offer like somebody will offer something like i want to buy your car so i'm offering you my car and uh, for a certain dollars amount uh, the acceptance would be saying yes or or sending me an email saying yes or anything that show me that you accepted my offer and the last part would be um, consideration which basically we are exchanging something of value this is overall the, gener the generic definition of contract. It can be different from one country to another, one culture to another, one law to another. Uh, this is the most Western, maybe, definition of the contract. 
and you know it's, it can have a little bit different uh, just, uh, it, it can be a little bit different from one area to another but we got, we are going to stick for this time being to the generic form as i said earlier there are six different elements of a contract and the first one would be it's an agreement and again we define agreement because it, it, as as has three different pillars or components an offer acceptance and consideration between two different part between between two or more competent parties and competent parties mean has capacity they have hold legal capacity and they have to have to hold uh, mental capacity and they, and a lot of time we also has to have some author authority to do that uh, another thing it used to be based on genuine assent or consent from the from the both parties so both parties have really to be uh, to have uh, a real genuine genuine need for this particular party there I mean it, it, we're trying to to take away any kind of blackmailing or pressure that one party can put to another it has to be supported by consideration as I said earlier consideration means it's changing something of value and that's important in order to be able to distinguish that from a gift a gift is not a contract or it's probably have special laws and special rules and regulations that's very different than from the contract laws overall uh, the fifth pillar would be it has to be made of legal objective. It cannot be done something illegal that or contradicts the country or the area or the jurisdiction. Uh, it has to be something legal. So you cannot sell something illegal in, 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 in a different specific country. And, and the last component would be in a form that's required by law. It can be sometimes the law required that certain contract has to be in writing other times it uh, doesn't have to be so it depends on the on the on the law again it depends greatly or very greatly between one country to another and from one area to another and also uh, different contracts have probably also different requirements so again I just want to emphasize that uh, every contract uh, has the has uh, it has to be an, it is an agreement a binding agreement and again it has to have the those important pillars, otherwise it will not be all fulfilled the contractual obligation requirements. There are three major different types of contracts. We have fixed price, uh, cost reimbursable, and time and material contracts. Uh, some, it has, some people can call them uh, lump sum contracts, cost plus contracts, and unit price contracts. The same thing, different, uh, different terminologies for them. So we'll start off with a fixed price contract. Fixed price contracts are also called as uh, lump sum contracts are probably the most common type of contracts that we mostly see, especially in governmental and semi-governmental um, organization. Those are basically you are, uh, one party has to reimburse or to, to compensate the other party for a certain dollars amount, uh, regardless of what's going on. Uh, if whether the price of the steel go up, price of uh, the silicon chips went down, dollars go up, it doesn't matter. By the end of the day, one party has to pay the other party a specific dollars amount. Uh, that can be very different from the cost reimbursable, which is a cost plus uh, contract. In the first one, as we said, in the first in the fixed price, usually the contractor burden or take most of the burden of the risk because if something happens to the prices of the raw material or any generic uh, or uh, elements specific in the contract that makes the that, that will shrink his profit uh, because again for the other party the owner or the client will have to pay the same amount regardless so having said that the contractor has to pay has has actually the burden of the risk and so and therefore he has to find a way in order to compensate for that risk somehow um uh, the cost plus is be is going to be a little bit uh, a little bit different from that aspect in this case the owner has in, will engage with the contractor with this contractual obligation in which the owner will 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 compensate the contractor with their cost their pure cost plus whatever percentage or fee that the contractor that, that the contractor will earn according to the contract or the way the, the way the contract is written uh, in this case probably clearly actually uh, we can see the difference in that uh, sense that in fixed price 
the the risk uh, will be on on the on the on the contractor while in the in the in the cost plus contracts the most of the risk will be on the client because again whatever happens the the contractor will be will will keep uh, uh, presenting invoices in which the client has to compensate the contractors for um, so again uh, the risk is is connected somehow to different elements and that's that that I would like just to to pre to present the to, to present the impact of the decision on which type of contract that we have to engage in and the risk associated with that the last type of contract is probably common as well especially in smaller smaller contracts or smaller purchases uh, and that is time and material or what we call it what we also call it unit price contract in which the owner will be compensating the contractor per unit or per hour or per kilo per ton whatever I mean the the, the agreement would be so those are the three major contracts a lot of what if we would run into it if we go with a unit price contract it will be somewhere in the middle between the fixed price and the cost plus it has some fixed price elements and has also some cost plus elements into the unit price and that's why we can say both parties share the risk having said that it doesn't mean that the unit price would be probably the best way to go all the time uh, every every type of contract has pros and cons and there is no perfect or no best type of contract it depends on the situation it depends on the organization it depends on so many different factors that we need to take into consideration before we make such a judgment uh, having said that also I just want to make sure that people understand the fact that uh, those are umbrellas if you will uh, it's uh, it's categories uh, so we have fixed price contract category and cost plus contract category and time and material category and me, which means that under each category we probably have a different uh, we have three to four to maybe five different types uh, we're not going to go into every one every one of them uh, and the difference between each one of them however we need to pay attention that we can see or we we, we will see a different we will see different types of, of, of contracts uh, under each of these categories. Uh, let's uh, start again with the uh, contract framework, or some people like to like to call it uh, contract life cycle, if you will. Uh, and it has it has three. I, I made the four because sometimes they like to put evaluation as a separate uh, separate. Uh, phase uh, but generally what we mostly what most of the time we see is we have three different phases we have preparation or some people call it pre-award phase uh, we have award and and we have finally administration or a lot of people also know it as uh, contract uh, post award phase so what are we talking about let's assume, let's think about the award is the the time frame where we finally select the final contract and we engage with them in order to finalize all the components of the contract and sign the contract so this is the award phase anything prior to that is will probably be under the preparation phase and anything after the signature of the contract will be the administration phase so everything we do from scratch all the way until we basically get to the point of selecting contractors the, con the right contractor or the winner will be under the preparation phase and everything goes from the moment we award the contract all the way until the contract is closed and delivered will be under the administration phase so we'll start off with the contract preparation contract preparation we are going to go through seven main steps what do we do in this as we are going to uh, we, we start usually off the contract preparation by identifying needs contracts are not born out of vacuum uh, contracts are usually come as a response to a need certain needs would would force or would make that possible so overall organization has to have a certain need and that certain need need to be fulfilled somehow either in-house or by outsource uh, after that after we identify the need and the and the, the proper the proper use of that need 
we go to the uh, we need to develop what they call a business case and market research we we need first to find out how can especially if we if we need to fill that need from out from outside how are we going we need to find out what are you know who can be able to do it for us uh, that's would be part of your market research what organization will be able to provide you that particular service or that particular product or goods uh, we also need to build a business case uh, a business case that describe different aspects such as uh, where to get this from if we are end up going to what would be the total approximate budget? Uh, what would be the cost versus the benefit? Uh, what would be the availability of such a product or service in this market? So we need to develop the feasibility or the you know justification for that particular uh, coming project. After that, we need to develop number three would be the developing acquisition plan. Acquisition plan, we need first to make a decision. Are we going uh, in-house or we are going outsource? If we are going in-house, the process here stops. It uh, will go through a different process, probably through manufacturing or, or engineering or something like that. But from our perspective in contract and procurement, the process here will stop. If we're going outsourcing by doing a contract, that's one thing that we need uh, to make a decision about in this particular step. So we have a need, it needs to be fulfilled. That's step number two, and then step number three, which would be we need to go, out, we need to outsource that one. Uh, if we decide to go out uh, to go that route, which is outsourcing or contracting, we we need to evaluate our resources both internally and externally. Uh, we need to answer certain questions such as, uh, do we have the capability of creating scope of work? Do we have uh, the capability of uh, of going? Of administering a con administering contracts, uh, do we have the resources for that? Do we have the knowledge and the experience? Do we have financing? Uh, do we have uh, do we have uh, credit? Uh, you know, a lot of uh, number of questions that we need to be addressed at this point. Uh, by evaluating these resources, after that we go through developing a a whole a whole contract plan. Contract plan. We need to answer very important question at this point, such as. What type of contract? Am I going to go with fixed price contract? Am I going to go with a cost plus contract? And what what or am I going to go with a unit price contract? And even if I want to go with a fixed price contract, I need to answer questions such as what type of fixed fixed price contract I need to go with. So those need to be addressed. Another thing that probably also determine the strategy going forward: Am I going to go with a one contractor, or am I going to go with several contractors so i need to break down the scope of work into several components and i need to give each one of them each 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 part of the scope of work to a different contractor uh, these decisions need had to be addressed at this point uh, and that will help me to go to step number six which is writing a scope of work uh, scope of work is what we call it a lot of time the heart of the contract and that is simply what description a full description of uh, of the pro of the of the of the project itself, um, and finally after that we need to determine: Are we gonna go or giving this uh, bid or or this this uh, this contract or the way we gonna solicit contractors going to be through pre-qualification? Am I gonna go with an open bid? Am I gonna go with the shortlisting? What is the strategy? I need to go and do it overall in order to get. Uh, potential contractors. Uh, before we go forward, I would like to present that poll in front of you, and that poll basically says the following. What do you think, number one reason for challenges we face in managing contracts in the Middle East? What do you guys think? Okay, uh, we're about done, I guess. Uh, okay, we're gonna end voting at this moment. 
last chance go ahead okay fine uh end voting and that is show results basically what you guys say is uh, almost there are people saying between pro poor performance measurement system or i think people are referring to poor kpis the other one would be poor or unclear scope of work or that tie uh, 30 percent each and then you have unqualified contractor a little bit less and soil and singer sourcing will be probably the least um, the result is kind of expected uh, but uh, generally speaking when i ask this questions probably in the training rooms or overall uh, more generically uh, i might have a little bit more lead towards the third one which is poor or unclear scope of work a lot of people are suffering from this point and that's why um, a lot of people think that you know that the better we do in in preparing ourselves or investing our time in doing scope of work the less problems we face in the future overall so again it is kind of expected uh people have different reasons why you think we having problems overall and challenges in the middle east for contracts but one of the main or leading reasons would be the scope of work overall uh, scope of work. What is scope of work? Is a document that we usually, uh, as I said earlier, is the heart of the con of any contract. It is a document that explains in, in in details what are the goods and the services in sufficient detail uh, that need to be uh, we require it or need to be uh, we need to acquire it through contractors. Uh, the better, the more complete, the clearer the scope of work, the less problems and headaches we are going to face towards the contract administration uh, part. So again, uh, the, a lot of people think about it this way. Uh, the, the more I invest in time and effort and, 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 and preparing good scope of work, the better overall we see results in terms of contracts we can see in general, in general, generally speaking. Uh, what do we see in the contract uh, scope of work? Actually, think about it this way, scope of work answer your basic six English language questions or any, I think, any language question, which is what, why, where, when, who, and how. So basically you will see in scope of work is it's a description, a full description, which, which is a description of the work required, which is addresses the answer, the question what. But also you need to put to, to, to include, if possible, the objective why we're doing this contract or why we're doing this project and that's basically address the question of why uh, how long the timing uh, how much the budget uh, the performance standard uh, reporting requirements resources need to be provided staffing requirements all these aspects need to be addressed as well if you have a bet if you have a better written probably scope of work so scope of work as we said is one of the leading uh, lead, uh, uh, one of the most important document of the project uh, of the project overall and it's one of probably the most difficult one because again you need to to, the, to create something that both parties has to commit into it uh, for the duration of the contract evaluation will be the second phase and a lot of time again uh, people uh, sometimes uh, i i actually put it differently this time a lot of time i merge it with the preparation uh, overall, what do we do in evaluation? We go through four steps, especially if, we can, if we're talking about bidding process. We start off with a preliminary evaluation in which we are making sure that, uh, you know, there is no major deviation, uh, something that will, you know, we don't want to waste our time and effort and money in trying to uh, evaluate something that we know that we're not going to be a candidate any, uh, anyway. So, we do preliminary evaluation to make sure that we are checking the eligibility, the, you know, the, the, the agreements, uh, the overall agreements, the signatures, all those, you know, important things. If, uh, if we pass, if the, if the bidder uh, passes the preliminary evaluation, it goes through what we call it technical and commercial evaluation. We need to evaluate each bid technically and commercially, sometimes together, and other times we do them separately. So it depends again on the organizational policy of your organization. We need to evaluate, we need to try to use evaluation criteria. Uh, so we need to know beforehand, before we start opening bids, 
that what are we evaluating and what are the criteria accordingly. Uh, we do that again before we receive and opening bids. By the time we do this evaluation and applying those evaluation criteria, we can determine whether which one of the potential bidder will be the winner and that particular potential bidder will be recommended to be awarded this particular contract. So we need to do the last thing that a uh, committee or the tendering committee need to do is, is, is to write the recommendation report for that particular bidder. Uh, after that, we enter the third phase, which is we need to ask, uh, this is probably a shorter phase in which that we need to sign, uh, we need to complete the signature and acceptance for the terms or the conditions of the contract. Uh, so we need to address certain things such as, do we need to negotiate at this point? Um, yes or no, and why? Uh, Pre-award me meeting, should we, should we do pre-award meeting or we should pass? Uh, how are we going to address the questions, for example? Uh, documentation, has how, need, how, how do we need to, to document every, every aspect of the preparation phase? Um, are we going with the contract award? How are we going to inform the bidder and how do we need to finalize the, the contract? Uh, we need to start uh, issuing commencement order. Uh, approval for materials, equipment, uh, we probably have to communicate the, our HSE procedures. And finally, we need to also make sure that all parties are appro uh, approved for our monitoring procedures. So again, in this one basically can be summarized as selection of the contractor and also awarding and uh, basically signing the contract. And at that point, we enter the last uh, phase of this contract in which that uh, we are, we, we signed the contract, we are moving forward, so we need to make sure that we, the contractor is uh, meeting our contractual, uh, his contractual re re requirement or he's complying basically. We need to make sure that the contractor comply uh, with everything, the terms and conditions and the provisions of the contract. Uh, we need to make sure that we are able to administer and manage day-to-day -day operations, making sure our eyes are open. And, uh, and making sure the contractual are complying again. Uh, we need, if we find any problems or any deviation, we need to start providing notices on time before we lose our right. Also, we need to, we are the one, uh, the administrators would be the one who knows how to get the authorization and from who, and who, and the approvals, and again, from who. Uh, in this phase, there are a lot of tools and techniques that can help us administering the contract. And uh, we, you, you know, they, they, they need to be, because again, it's not very, it's not very easy job to do that. You need to make sure that everything within the contract will be applied. Contract administration, again, include things like mobilization, communication, uh, schedule and cost management, variation orders and change management, claims, extensions, dispute resolutions, uh, uh, disputes over all conflicts, uh, variation orders, all those are part of every time's day, every time, every day's life of contract administrator. Contract management tip. A couple of things I just want to address before the end of this webinar. Uh, the first thing is it's extremely important to take time to read and understand and analyze your contract. Fortunately, I've been meeting some, uh, I've been you know, encountering some people uh, who never read a contract. So I'm not sure how they, how are you able to administer a contract if you did not read it very well. Uh, you need to read it and have a basic understanding. You don't have to be an attorney by any means, but you have to have a, to have a basic understanding for the contract. Uh, you need to establish some kind of monitoring protocol. How, how, I, how am I going to monitor the performance of the contractor? Uh, we need to know, we need to document. I mean, one of the most important messages for anyone in contract business is document, document maybe, and document some more. Documentation for everything is extremely important. And you need to manage issues and variation and deviation as you go. Do not let it accumulate towards the end, otherwise it will kill the project overall. Uh, best practices, uh, standard, uh, standardize your processes. So what, the way you manage certain contract does not change every time we change a product or a service or a company. 
uh, communication is extremely important part of uh, contract management. Uh, make sure, and it's a very important part of any contract administrator or manager because we manage and communicate every time, every day. A um, big chunk of our time is actually spent in communication. Lessons learned is another important takeaway. Uh, lesson learned is uh, do not, you know, so we do not repeat our 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 mistakes. Uh, document the goods and the bad. Uh, and finally, create some kind of online repository for contracts that commonly use uh, terms. Finally, uh, this is actually show the courses we provide as Merck, and it's how they are related to what I just talked about. Again, uh, we have a course for preparation phase. Uh, we have another course for administration phase. We have a, another separate training course for tendering uh, and bidding evaluation. Uh, if you want, if your business include they include some negotiation about contract, so we have another course just for negotiation. Problems, disputes, and conflicts and headaches are also discussed in the fifth course, which is managing contractual claims. Project management, uh, there is a very tie relation, a very very strong tie between project management and contract management. So we have a course that basically tie those two together, the relationship between them, how they affect each other, and how, what we do we need in order to be able to do both contract and project management properly. And finally, the, the last, uh, the, the most, or the, the most uh, recent courses that I just added to our, our portfolio and contract is the last one, which is going to be introduced actually for the first time in December, end of December, towards the in the third or the fourth week of December, which is drafting contracts and writing a scope of work. I think there is a major need in the Middle East, especially about that particular course, because there is um, no, not really uh, a lot of uh, alternative or training for that particular type of course. That will come to the end to the end of the webinar, or my actually part of the webinar for now. Uh, what I'm going to do is now we're going to start receiving any questions. Uh, We're gonna we're gonna probably give a few minutes in case of there's any questions. If there is no questions, we're gonna stay in, like we're gonna say for probably a couple of minutes. If there are no questions at all, uh, we're gonna probably conclude this webinar. Thank you everyone for listening, and we're waiting. I'll give you just a couple of minutes. Okay, I got a, uh, I, uh, I got actually a question from Mr. My or Miss, I'm not sure. Uh, Maya Pan, uh, how can we avoid claims? There is no way to avoid claims. Uh, there is a way to reduce maybe claims, uh, but to avoid them altogether is kind of impossible, especially for large size projects. Maybe for smaller projects, you probably can get away with that, but for large size projects, it's virtually impossible. How can we reduce the claims is probably can be addressed several ways. Uh, as I said earlier, if we have a good written scope of work, that's probably number one weapon for you. Uh, if you uh, just the, the clear scope of work is a way to reduce the number of claims overall. Uh, the way we do contract administration is another way, another way is what we're trying to what I try to say. If you are if, if we have good contract administrators, they probably be able to address all the problems before we start to be, you know, getting bigger and we start having claims. Again, claims usually we've we've seen it as un when we do not have a response 
for a certain, you know, uh, request or, you know, a, a problem that we face over or an issue that we have. So that's why uh, that's why we can see uh, the, the the impact of that. Again, if you have a good good uh, scope of work, uh, very clear scope of work. If you have a very good team in your kind of administration, uh, you probably be able to reduce the number of claims that we face overall. And that's how we see overall. Another question I got is from Mr. or uh, Mr. Al or Ms. Al uh, uh, Alka. Uh, how much how much importance is given to safety in this region? Uh, it it's very important. I mean, now in every major organization that I encountered, they have their own HSE policy. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on it. Uh, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on it, and. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not in safety specifically, but you can definitely, from our perspective as contracts, we generally speaking, we see uh, provisions in the contracts that call for safety. And we can see it also in the terms and conditions, uh, which is very similar to the one that we see also in North America. From my experience, I, basically the provisions, the, term, the terms and conditions that we see here in the Middle East, very similar to the one that we see also in North America. Uh, technically, more than that, I really do not know about safety. It's probably different than contracts, if you're talking about that. But I'm just answering it from contract from con from contract perspectives. I hope that answers your question. If not, just let me know as well. Thank you. Thank you also, Mr. M or uh, Mehandran. Uh, I hope I answered your question. You wrote, yes, I did. So thank you very much. Uh, are there any more questions here? Somebody's typing something, so probably give it another couple of minutes. Okay, got a message from Mr. Rami. Mr. Rami said, uh, how does the change in the way of contract administrator affect the project? How does the change in the way of contract administration? I'm not sure if I, if I really capture what you really mean. What do you mean by exactly how does change in the way of contract administration? Uh, I'm not really sure about that part, but Contract administration definitely affect the project greatly. Uh, as we said earlier, the change of in the procedure. Okay, the since it, it does affect it. Uh, it does affect it greatly. Um, the project by the end of the day have deliverables, products or services. Uh, regardless of what you do, you should end up having those products and services. However, how to get there can be can change and can be different significant significantly. And it can make your life probably easier, can make your life or, or the other contractor's life much more complicated. Uh, the contract administration is, again, a way that we need to make sure that, uh, that the contractor is complying. So whatever tool you're using, uh, you need to make sure or ensure there is a compliance of the contractor. Again, some people believe that to, to hold maybe a, a tight leash on that, and some people do not. So it depends on your organization. However, there will be an effect on the project, the more uh, that the more difficult you make it for the contractor, the more probably also gonna gonna expect some kind of more pro problems and issues you can face from the contractors. So, what I'm trying to say, it probably would not affect the final product overall or the service overall, but it will affect your relationship with the contractor and it will affect your the way we're gonna get there. So I think. That's my, you know, my take. I don't know if that answered your question or I am off. So please let me know if uh, I don't know if there's any more questions as well. We have another 20 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Rami. I, I hope I did answer that question. Uh, I don't know. We'll wait for a few minutes now.
Okay, uh, thank you, Alka, for joining us. Uh, Alka is leaving us now. Thank you very much. Any more questions, guys? Let me try there. Somebody probably is typing. Let's wait for a minute and then we're going to conclude if we don't have anything. Okay, guys, I think at this point we are going to conclude. For more questions or anything you'd like me to address, please do not hesitate to contact us through www.merc.com. And I think you will be, you can see if uh, you need to, you know, if you have any questions be addressed to me, it will be forwarded to me, and I'll be more than happy to thank you guys very much. It was a true pleasure. I hope uh, that was used, you know, fruitful, and I hope I answered all of your questions. I hope you guys have a wonderful evening, and I'll uh, tell, hopefully we'll see you in next webinar. Okay, have a great day, guys. Bye bye now. Dot com.